how to make piston feed tapes like these ones. They are made by pushing the first block with a piston and then using observers to activate the next piston in line until we've come full circle. Aside from being very cool for decorative builds, they can also be used for things like data storage. For example, by hooking up this 8 block free tape to an inverted daylight sensor, we can keep track of the moon cycle. This way we know exactly when a full moon is coming, so we can go hunt for slimes and black cats. Here's a quick Minecraft tip. It takes exactly 5 minutes for an item to despawn, which is the same time it takes for animals to become willing to breed again. So you can drop a junk item on a wooden pressure plate after breeding to know the exact moment your animals can breed again. Did you know this method for transporting villagers? You can make them walk wherever you want by using their pathing behavior. There are several ways to do this. Number 1. Breaking and placing their job site block during their workday. Composters are the cheapest, but if you've already traded once, you have to use the block of that profession. Number 2. Keep moving their beds at night time. They will keep walking to the new bed. This method is flawed though, because moving villagers at night can be dangerous. And then finally, my favorite method is where you ring a bell to make them panic and go to a bed at any time of the day. All villagers will go to there, making it easy to move entire villages. If you want them to travel a lot of blocks, you can even use this method to lure them into the nether, so you only need to travel one eighth of the distance. This is an automatic wool farm. It works by having an observer watch a grass block that activates a dispenser with shears when a sheep eats it. A minecart with hopper picks up the wool from beneath. The grass then regrows because it is surrounded by other grass blocks. We don't want the sheep to eat those because they aren't being watched by an observer. That's why we place something on top that doesn't turn it to dirt but prevents the sheep from reaching it. Examples are walls, fences, leaves and glass blocks. If you want the farm to look prettier and let the sheep roam, we have to give up about 10% of efficiency by replacing one neighboring block with something like moss. Now we can just make a pen around it that's not larger than a 6x6 area where you cover the regrow blocks. If you want you can build a house next to it to give it more life. Three ways to transport items vertically. Number one. Through full blocks. Glass is the most common because it's fun to look at the items, but all other full blocks work, which can be handy in some builds. All you have to do is make sure there are solid blocks next to every side of the column above the dropper. The corners don't have to be filled in. Number two. By using a dropper vader. The most compact one uses observers, which you can build like so. But you can also make them using torch towers if you're low on quartz. Number 3. Sending them through a bubble column. You can make one by placing a soul sand block under water source blocks, which you can create by placing and destroying kelp in a water stream. Joe was right. Oh, mm, yeah. Oh, amazing. Each flavor was totally unique. But combine one flavor with another, and something new was created. In this quick redstone video, we'll look at burnout circuits. We can use the fact that torches burn out if they get more pulses than they can process to create compact contraptions that spit out a certain number of pulses. This one gives 9 pulses before turning off, but we can alter this amount by letting the signal pass through components who process those pulses differently. You can use it to make custom shops. Another example use are compact doorbells or songs with repetitive notes.
Here's a bug that Minecraft will never fix. It's called quasi-connectivity and makes it possible to power pistons through the air above it as long as it gets a block update. It happens because pistons are programmed as doors, with the only difference being that the upper block of a door creates the block update itself. It has become an integral part of so many builds that Mojang has decided it's a feature, not a bug. You can make working bookshelves in Minecraft. You can then use it as a fancy keycard system to open a secret base where the right book needs to be in the right shelf. Another option is to use a block swapper with a sideways loom to show when it's empty. To actually make it work, I rename a barrel or dropper to bookshelf, then I use a dirt pad for bottom shelves and beds as a ceiling to make top ones. Did you know you can glitch above the nether without using an ender pearl by using boats instead? Simply place one below Y level 126 and enter it. Now dismount it while you jump up. I place another boat on top of the bedrock while I am dismounting because sometimes you get stuck so you need to enter the extra boat on top. Don't forget the materials to make another portal so you aren't stuck above the bedrock. This is a fully automatic crop farm. I like to build it level by level. Take down two blocks on the entire level except the upper ledge. Now cover it all in a trail of rails so a minecart with hopper can go around. If it's a large area, you're better off making multiple trails. Make sure you put an unloader on the end of every trail. Now cover the entire area in dirt. I fill the edge with a water trail, but this isn't necessary. After that you can place a composter on top of a water block for about every 50 blocks of surface. I make a roof of trapdoors so the villagers can't make compost. Now it's time to actually let the villagers in to finish. First they'll fill their inventory, but after that all the crops will go to you. Now you can just build more levels if you feel like it. In this quick redstone video, we'll look at hopper timers. There are many kinds of timers, but hopper timers are the most versatile. You can put in as many items as you want, where every item adds 7 ticks of delay to the initial 8 ticks. You can also use a piston based RS knowledge, which is more compact, but also louder and requires slime balls. An example use is to turn on a redstone clock for a certain period, giving you control over the amount of pulses. Mob farm looks like this. It's time you build something around like this. Start with making a non-perfect circle around the base and build it up for a few layers. Then it's time to add some variants by for example moving the circle a block now and then. If you want some greens in the lower part of the trunk, you can plant some trees now and then when you're about halfway there. When you get near the top, it's time to add some branches. Just use some wooden blocks that start at the trunk and go up now and then. Plant some trees next to the branches to get some randomly generated greens. Then add leaves between the branches so the cobblestone gets hidden. Don't forget to light everything up, because we only want the spawns to be inside the farm. Now plant some bigger trees where the branches come out, so we get some more volume. Make sure to connect the branches to the big trees. Now go on the roof and make sure all the cobblestone is hidden. Now if you want you can first build a tree house, after which you can fill the rest up with more trees and leaves. Finally add some roots to finish the builds. Here are 5 things Minecraft boomers do. Number 1. Spam click with their bows. We've had to charge bows for 11 years now, but that doesn't mean there still aren't some very old timey people who instinctively spam with their bow. Number 2. Put saddles on pigs. Who needs horses when you can control pigs with a carrot on a stick? I'd say most people, but not all veterans agree. Number 3. Use the wrong commands. Toggle downfall and things like numbered game modes are no longer working commands, but people who are used to them still type them. Number 4. Craft everything from memory without using the recipe book. They still mess up the shield recipe though. Number 5. Forget they have a left hand. An extra hand is pretty handy, especially when caving, but people who have played too much in the past tend to forget to use it. In this quick redstone video, we'll look at ant gates. 
An AND gate is a logical gate that generates an output only when both inputs are active. There are many designs you can find online, but the most popular one is a very simple one that's easy to remember, that's also easy to extend for more inputs. Once you know it exists, you'll use it all the time. An example of a use is to add an extra layer of protection to a secret entrance because you need to activate multiple things at once to reveal it. In this quick redstone video, we'll look at OR gates. An OR gate is a logical gate that differs from an AND gate in that it always generates an output unless both inputs are inactive. The difference between an OR gate and simply connecting the inputs is that an OR gate isolates the output from the inputs, allowing the inputs to be used in other gates. There are many designs you can find online, but the most popular one is a very simple one that's easy to remember, that's also easy to extend for more inputs. In this quick redstone video, we'll look at XOR gates. Unlike a regular OR gate, the exclusive OR gate doesn't generate an output if both inputs are active. Another way to look at this is that the output changes whenever you change any of the inputs. You probably have some light switches at your house wired as if they were connected to an XOR gate. For example, at a staircase, you turn the lights on at one end and you turn them off at the other end. In this quick redstone video, we'll look at NOT gates. They are also known as inverters because they generate the inverse of their input. You can put a NOT gate after an OR gate or AND gate to create a NOR gate or NAND gate, although it's more efficient to build those gates directly like so. Both these gates have the interesting property that you can make any logical behavior with only either of them. For example, here is last video's XOR gate made with only NAND gates. Can you make it with only NOR gates? In this quick redstone video, we'll look at RS NOR latches. They are a form of memory that has a set and a reset option. There are many designs out there, but I prefer the classic one that just uses torches. Once you've used the set option, you can only turn it off using the reset signal. An example use is in combination locks, where you need to activate signals in a certain order. They are also used to create hopper timers, on which I'll make my next video. Toggleable redstone clocks. Number one, the comparator clock. I like it because it is silent, and most importantly, you can choose its delay to be any number of ticks. By default, it's a one tick clock, but by adding repeaters, you can customize it as you desire. It does require a quartz component though, which isn't ideal in survival. Number two, the repeater torch clock. It's resource friendly and its customizable delay is already built in. The problem is that its delay starts at 3 ticks, so it's not a catch-all design. In this quick redstone video, we'll look at filters. Filters combine the properties of comparators and hoppers to only let certain items go through. To do this, we need to fill the hopper with the right amount of blocks so that one extra item will make the comparator send out a stronger signal, which we use to unpower the bottom hopper, making the item go through. We fill the rest of the hopper with randomly renamed blocks to make sure only the filtered item can get through. The most popular use for filters is sorting systems, but they can also be used to make shops or keycard security systems. In this quick redstone video, we'll look at 
Vertical redstone! Depending on your situation, you'll use different methods to accomplish this. Number 1. Classic Torch Tower This is compact and resource friendly, but every torch creates a delay of one tick, so it isn't really fast. Number 2. The Transparent Block Tower the behavior of redstone with transparent blocks makes it possible to make a too wide tower. We can only go up 15 blocks before we have to renew the signal, which we can do with the torch method. Number 3. Slime block piston towers. These are very expensive, but pretty quick and compact, which makes them pretty popular. Number 4. Bubble observers. We use the fact that observers can see if water is a bubble column to create the fastest and relatively cheap vertical wiring. The design is pretty bulky though. In this quick redstone video, we'll look at comparators. A comparator has four functions. Number one, maintaining a signal's strength. Unlike repeaters, a comparator's output will have exactly the same strength as its input. Number two, Compare the strength of signals. The output is only active if the input signal strength is bigger than the largest side input. Number 3. Subtract signal strengths. The output strength is equal to the difference between the input and the largest side input. For this functionality, you have to right click the comparator so that the little torch turns on. Number 4. Measure a block state. This is mainly used to check how full a container is. The fuller the container, the stronger the output signal. You can find many tables online that show how strong the signal is in which situation. This is a fast travel ship. Here's how it works. If you sleep in the bed, you wake up at your destination. You can also travel quickly by opening and closing the barrel. There's a tutorial in the description. In this quick redstone lesson, we'll look at chunk loading. For those who don't know, a chunk is a 16 by 16 segment in which your world gets generated. To prevent lag, only the chunks around the world spawn and players are actually actively processed. However, if an entity passes through a nether portal, the chunks around the other side of the portal are also loaded for 15 seconds. We can abuse this mechanic by having an entity go back and forth through another portal to have those chunks permanently loaded without being around. This is what's called a chunk loader and it is useful to keep automatic farms working even when you're far away. Since the chunk loader only loads one extra chunk in each direction, we need to place one every third chunk if we want to load a larger area. In this quick redstone lesson, we look at zero tick repeaters. Normal repeaters delay your signal by two game ticks, which can be annoying in many situations. That's why people abuse piston mechanics to build contraptions that extend redstone signals without adding a delay. You can use them to get certain timings right in redstone builds or to generally make them quicker. Another popular use for them is long distance redstone signals on which I'll make my next video. In this quick redstone lesson, we look at long distance redstone. For some builds, you want the redstone signal to travel a lot of blocks. Just like regular long distance travel, a good way to do this is through the nether. To transfer a signal from the overworld to the nether, you simply send an item or entity through a portal to activate a signal on the other end. To the reverse at the end of the signal to send it back to the overworld. If you still need to travel a lot of blocks in the nether, you can use zero tick repeaters to prevent signal delay. Don't forget that your chunks need to be loaded though, otherwise your signal won't get through. In this quick redstone lesson, we'll look at stasis chambers. We can use the bubble column created by placing a block of soul sand under some water source blocks to prevent a thrown ender pearl from ever landing on a block. We can then let the pearl collide with a block whenever we want to teleport to that block. This is called a stasis chamber, and the most popular version just uses a trapdoor to create the collision. You can then hook up a timer, like a daylight sensor, to the trapdoor or let a friend press a button to teleport to the chamber. 
Remember that the chunks still need to be loaded in order for the timer to work. A final important note is that all your floating ender pearls disappear whenever you die, so watch out for that. In this quick redstone lesson we look at nether traveling. The nether is 8 times smaller than the overworld. For every block you travel in the nether, you actually move 8 blocks in the overworld. This means that we can build a hub in the nether to make long distance travel less tedious. To prevent annoying obstructions, it is best to use an ender pearl to teleport above the nether to build your portals there. From there just divide the x and z coordinates of your starting point and destination by 8 and build your portals there. This Minecraft maze is almost impossible to solve unless you know the secret. Changes every Minecraft hour. But don't worry, the statue shadow points to the path you can take to have an easy solution. I made the changing walls using the simple double piston extender to push green concrete powder up and down. elevators in any shape you want. First you build the shape of the floor you want two levels lower than you actually desire. Now it's time to puzzle a bit. Make shapes of up to four blocks from honey and slime blocks. The shapes may not touch another shape of the same block type. Each shape must touch the side of the shape with at least one block. Now you can cover the blocks with your desired floor. Next we are going to build this flying machine under every shape. We will power them all at once so the floor moves as a whole. To stop it, we place powered repeaters that feed an unpushable block like glazed terracotta or obsidian into the same block we used to power the piston. To go back down, we just need to unpower all the Here's a quick at redstone once. tip. You can build this contraption to turn pulses into a lever signal. It's called a T flip flop and you can build it like this. I use it all the time. Most recently I used it to make the secret base entrance with multiple levels. First there is a pulse from a fishing rod that activates the moving floor, but uses a T flip flop to activate the brakes to keep it on the first floor. To go to the actual base you need to take a book from this shelf and put it in this one to deactivate the brakes. This volcano is actually a hidden evil lair. If you happen to go fishing in the lava, the secret gets revealed. I made it using my elevator design. So check out that tutorial if you want to make something similar. I used TNT to turn this mountain into a volcano lair. First I flattened the top a bit. Then I placed two TNT dupers to hollow out the main shaft. I then made an extra chamber using Borkon's tunnel bore design. Next I changed the walls to turn it into my evil throne room. I then added an elevator, which I made sure was lava proof. This way I can let the lava flow right next to it. Finally I added some extra details to make it feel a bit more realistic. Now I just need to go fishing in the lava to enter my evil In there. this video we'll make this slot machine using the concepts from my past few short videos. I'll put up a link to the corresponding video whenever one of those contraptions comes up so you can get a more in-depth explanation in case you're confused. Finally, I want to give a small disclaimer. I made this build to encompass as many of my short lessons as possible so you guys can see them put to use. This does mean, however, that it isn't the most efficient way to create something like this, but I hope you will be able to understand all of the underlying principles so you can fully customize it as you want. I'll include a link to the world map and schematic in the description. First we'll make spinning wheels using piston feed tapes. In this video we'll make one with three wheels but you can make any number once you understand how the machine works. 
I'm going for a 9 long fee tape, but you can make them larger if you want to modify the chances of winning or if you want more possible combinations. We delay the last piston with a 2 tick repeater to make sure the first piston is no longer extended when it tries to push. The second and third V-tape are exactly the same. We only need to make sure the signals that go to the last piston don't cross. We want to be able to read out what block is being shown to the player so we can determine the prizes. We can do this by using comparators. As you probably know, a comparator can't see the difference between, for example, a diamond block and a gold block, but they can check how full a container is. Luckily, the composter is a pushable container, so we can use a nifty little trick where we actually let every winning block correspond to a composter that we read out on the opposite end. Here I show, using similarly colored wool, where you need to place the composter that corresponds to which block. As you can see, the fee tapes I used can have up to four different winning blocks, but I chose to have three, with iron being extra common. A composter can send out a signal with a strength up to 8, depending on how full it is. So that's the maximum of unique winning blocks we can have if we were to build a larger feed tape. I fill the composter that corresponds to the iron blocks for one level. I do this by adding compostable materials like kelp or seeds until I hear a high digging sound. It is random how many items you need to add, so listen closely. If it makes a low sound, it didn't count as a layer of compost. The same concept applies for the gold block, where I fill its composter for two levels and then again for the diamond block with three levels. I repeat this for the other feed tapes. Now let's use the signals our comparators read to generate the desired outputs. Let's go look at the payout table and see what we're trying to accomplish. There are three payout tiers. To make everything better to follow, I'll use some color coding. For the small payout of 3 diamonds, I'll use white wool. For the medium one of 8 diamonds, I'll use yellow wool. And for the big win, I'll use light blue wool. We'll use logic gates to calculate when those are activated. For example, the small payout is active when iron and iron and iron or gold and gold and a random block or a random block and gold and gold. We can calculate the other payout tiers similarly. So we need AND logic for every payout tier. I start with making three lines of AND gates, where each line needs one extra redstone power to be reached. This means that we now have essentially converted each payout tier into inputs for the desired AND gates. Let's test this by letting the feed tapes rotate a bit and see if each block gets read correctly. Everything looks in order, so let's connect all the AND gates correctly. We'll read out the outputs at the bottom so they don't interfere with the rest of the build. We can use the outputs of the AND gates as the inputs of another AND gate to essentially create a triple input AND gate with a single output, which you can use for the payouts based on having three blocks in a row. Meanwhile, we use the regular AND gate outputs for the payouts based on having two winning blocks in a row. Since two gold blocks in a row give the same input as three iron blocks in a row, we need to connect those signals to the white wool path. We do however read an inverted version of the AND gates, so we need to invert them once more before they reach the white wool. We repeat the same process for the other tiers. 
We connect the gold AND gate to another AND gate so we get a signal that turns on when we have three gold blocks in a row. Once again we use double inversion to add the double diamond block signals to this path. After that we use a final AND gate to create the jackpot signal, where three diamond blocks are shown at once. Before we go any further, let's look at the vertical AND gate design. Both the top and bottom signal need to be on for the output to be active. We'll use it to only activate the top signal when the wheels have stopped spinning. This way the calculated winnings will only activate their dropper for the actual final stance. For now I'll just make a row of blocks that isn't connected to anything yet, but that way it's clear where we should bring the wool signals to. When all the wool is extended to the bottom input of the vertical AND gate, I start with making the payouts. I begin with the medium payout. Since I need 8 pulses, I'll connect the output of the AND gate to a burnout circuit, without any extra stuff at the end. For the medium output, we can use a burnout circuit as well, since we just need to add a 3 tick repeater to make it spit out 3 pulses. Now I start with placing the payout droppers, which I fill up with diamonds so we can actually get prizes from the pulses. I wanted a very large jackpot, so I had to resort to using a hopper timer connected to a comparator clock to give 100 pulses. By using one regular piston instead of two sticky pistons, I get a hopper timer that sends the items back and forth one time every time it gets activated. I simply connect this to a comparator clock and fill it with 26 items which is enough to give 100 pulses. Now that we're done with that, I test the machine once to see if I get the correct amount of diamonds for 3 iron blocks in a row. It seems to work, so now it's time to build a roof on which we'll add the redstone that makes the wheel spin. 
I start with making a roof that's as big as the floor. I make it out of cobblestone because I know I'm going to add some slabs beneath them anyway. So this won't be visible to people using the machine. After this I add two more rows on the left side so we have some extra space. We don't want people to be able to reactivate the machine while it's running because that would make it possible to manipulate your chances of winning. That's why the button signal needs to pass an RS NOR latch. We then use the latch to power a torch repeater clock with one extra tick of delay which we will use to let the wheel spin. Let's add some temporary buttons to test the current build. It seems to work but as you can see, it will keep spinning forever. That's why we need a randomizer that will deactivate the wheels one by one. We can make one by using the fact that a dropper spits out one of its items at random. If we fill it with items with different stack sizes, we can let it drop its items in another container that we then read out with a comparator. This will power the comparator with different degrees at random. I chose to have 3 single stack items and 3 16 stack items, but you can play around with this. For example, if you want the machine to spin longer, you can remove a single stack item and replace it with a 64 stack. We now use the comparator signal to deactivate the wheels by using sticky pistons as signal blockers. The first one needs a weaker signal, so it'll deactivate after just a few items have left the dropper. The middle one requires a little more and then the last one requires the strongest signal. This way they'll always stop spinning from left to right. We'll use the same signal strength as a final piston as the reset signal for the RS NOR latch, so it can be reused. We then add a piece of redstone wire that blocks the hopper as long as the wheels are spinning, so it keeps its items until they're done. Now let's see it in action. The wheels do in fact stop one by one, after which the RS NOR latch gets reset. Now let's connect the reset signal to the top of the vertical AND gate from earlier so we get the desired effect of reading out the machine once the wheels have stopped spinning. I use the sticky piston technique for some of the vertical redstone. Now let's add a payment barrel. I like to rename it using an anvil so it's clear for the user what they need to pay. I let it feed into a hopper that I'll use to create a filter so only diamonds can be used to play. I then let that hopper feed into a hopper line that goes into the winning dropper so it won't run out of diamonds. Because I've designed the prize pool in a way that the casino wins 12 diamonds on average every 100 games. Now let's make it into an actual filter. I fill the hopper with 18 diamonds and 4 randomly renamed items so only those will get through. 
We want to start a game whenever a diamond gets through, so I tap off the filter signal and bring it all the way to the top, to use as the set signal of the RS NOR ledge. This time I use the transparent block tower as a way of vertical redstone. When filming this I accidentally left a block of cobblestone but you'll see me remove it later in the video. Now let's go back to the payment barrel so we can add an item blocker since we only want one diamond to go through at a time. We also don't want the user to lose diamonds if they accidentally press the button again when the game is already going on. So I add another signal that blocks the hopper while the game is running. Now let's fix two little mistakes. We remove the cobblestone block that blocks the glass tower and add a piece of redstone to make the first triple AND gate work. To make sure the medium payment works, I let it block the low payment using a sticky piston. Now for some finishing touches, I add no blocks to the feed tapes. I put them on top of emerald blocks to get a digital sound, but gold blocks also work really well to get a slot machine like feeling. I like the sounds to go a bit back and forth, so I add a fourth no block that gets activated first. I recommend you use a major triad as the notes. Here are some examples on screen, but the basic gist is you choose a starting note, you then press the second one four more times, then you press the third one an additional three times, and finally you press the last one five times on top of that. If you only want to use three note blocks, I recommend you don't use the second one. Now let's add a note block that dings whenever a player wins. I let an observer watch the payout dropper, which I use to activate a note block on top of a gold block. I like the sound of a C, so I press it six times, but you can pick whichever you like. I then add a chest to collect excess diamonds for the casino. Now we just add some walls and a ceiling to hide the redstone. I use map images on an item frame to show the prize pool, but you can also use something like item frames or signs or even a combination. That's it, we're done! I hope you learned something and if you have any questions be sure to leave them in the comments. Downloading the world map or schematic is always another option if you're struggling to understand a certain part. Now that I mention it, in the world map is also a quick play slot machine that works similarly and looks like this. I won't be giving a step by step tutorial of this, but if you guys really want, just let me know. 
lot of people asked for it, so here is a tutorial for a Bedrock Edition version of my slot machine. I would really appreciate it if you left a comment on this video telling which version you play, so I have a better understanding of which versions I need to take into account for future videos. I wanted to keep this video short, so I'm just going to show what things you need to change if you follow the Java tutorial block by block. I'll also leave a world download in the description in case you're lost. First we need to change the feed tapes, because pistons tend to be a little more glitchy in Bedrock Edition. First I slow down the clock. Once that is done, we no longer need to delay the last piston of each feed tape, because the clock is so much slower. Next we'll lower all burnout circuits by one block, because redstone torches work a little different in Bedrock Edition. Now it's time to fix the payment button. We'll have to use a hopper dropper pulse limiter to make sure only one diamond gets paid at a time. We make it by letting the button activate a dropper with a single item that drops its item in a hopper that feeds it back in the dropper. We read out the hopper with a comparator that will unpower the hopper just long enough for one item to get through. Now let's change the jackpot timer. We replace the sticky piston with a regular one and we activate it with a NAND gate instead of an AND gate. We then use the inverted redstone block signal to activate the comparator clock. This means that we now have to double the amount of items in the hoppers to 52. Finally some finishing touches. We remove the payout chest and add one extra tick to this repeater. Because the feed tapes can be a little glitchy, I add some quartz blocks around the block that gets shown so that we don't see the redstone when it acts a bit laggy. To finish this video off, I'd like to show another way to configure the piston feed tapes so that there's more variation Today we are in going the shown to make blocks. large elevators with custom shapes and multiple floors. Let's start with an example of a typical use which is secret base entrances. I used an old pirate's trick where I hid the actual secret base beneath another one so that people who happen to see me enter think they've already found everything, while in fact you still need to take a book from this shelf and put it in here. We can go back to the library or the village. Let's go back to the village. Before we go into the tutorial, I want to make clear this tutorial is only for Java edition. But there is a YouTuber named Dr. Plasma who has an entire playlist of elevator tutorials for Bedrock edition. Let's jump into it. First you need to dig 6 blocks beneath the lowest level of floor you want, or build it 6 blocks in the air like I did here. Now you need to puzzle. Make shapes of up to 4 blocks from honey and slime blocks beneath the floor. Each shape must touch the side with at least one block. We do this to work around the push limit of pistons since honey and slime blocks don't stick together, which means we can power each shape with a separate flying machine. The floor will move as a whole as long as we activate them all at once. Now it's time to build the flying machines. I place redstone dust under the block of each shape that touches the side. Then I make the first flying machine by placing a temporary block on top of the dust followed by an upwards facing piston and honey blocks. Then an observer followed by a downward facing piston and two more honey blocks followed by a non-sticky block like obsidian. Then I start building the next one using slime blocks instead, because it's beneath a shape made of slime blocks. You'll probably think the next flying machine needs to be next to it. But we can't do that, because the upwards facing part of a flying machine can't be directly next to the downwards facing part of another one. That's why we leave an opening before building the next one. The other side is exactly the opposite, so I'll speed it up. Now 
When you've connected all the redstone, you can add a button to activate them and replace the cobblestone with observers who have their arrows pointing up. Don't press the button though, because we haven't built a stop yet. Speaking of which, let's build a first stop. I built up a bit using obsidian, but there are other block options on which I talk about at the end of this video in the shaft block section. So if you want to use other blocks, go watch that part first. Once I reach the desired floor height, I make an opening of 3 blocks because that's where we'll need to build our break. We'll have to place power shaft blocks next to the blocks of the upwards facing pistons. Just like we did at the bottom, it's important we power all of these shaft blocks on the same redstone tick. We do this so that when we eventually unpower the brake, all the flying machines will go down in unity. For now we'll just use an inverter to permanently power the blocks and then unpower them using a button to go back down. This means that we now have a very rudimentary version of the system so we can test it before we go further. Looks like we stop exactly where we intended and going back down isn't a problem, so we can proceed. I skipped ahead and built the next floor exactly like I built the first one, so I can show you what the next steps are. If we press the start button, we will stop at the first floor because we haven't changed anything about it. For the same reason, we'll also just go back down if we press the button. You see we need to unpower the brakes of the first floor before we come there if you want to go further up. That's why I'll place a lever for now, to show what happens. We do indeed go all the way up, but this does show a small flaw in the system, since we can only go down once we are on one of the middle levels. Now I'll use the lever to turn the first brakes back on, to show that even though we can only go down, that doesn't mean we can't stop somewhere in the middle. Another disclaimer though, is that when you do this, the floor will be one block higher than you would end up in the other direction. This is fixable, but a little too advanced for this video and not really a problem in my opinion. Of course we'll want to have some sort of panel to control the elevator like I already built here. Both buttons need to activate the bottom redstone because we need to go up, so we'll start with that. Next we'll have to make the buttons activate their corresponding brakes. We'll start with the first floor. First I built a T flip flop using 3 droppers and a hopper which will cycle one item to convert the button signal into a lever one. Now we just need to bring the comparator signal over to the brakes. I use the piston and slime block method for the vertical redstone, but if you're in survival you might want to use a more resource friendly method. I'm not sure if the signal is strong enough, so I first let the elevator down using the temporary system before I destroy it. Looks like I made the right choice because I should have placed my repeater a bit closer to the obsidian. Please note that I once again made sure all obsidian will be unpowered at once. Because I left the T flip flop in the wrong state, I take out the item from one dropper and put it in the other one. Now it should work, so let's test it again. Of course we haven't made a button to go back down yet, so we'll have to go back down to press the button again to return the elevator. Now let's build a button to go back down. Since this is a middle floor, we will only make downwards buttons, which in this case is only one button, because we can only go down one more level. It just needs to activate the T flip flop, so I do exactly that. Of course you don't have to use slime blocks here for the vertical redstone. Let's test it once more. Next we'll make the button to go to the second floor. I make another T flip flop that's a bit flipped since I want to use the piston slime block method again, which means that they can be next to each other. Now I just bring the signal all the way to the second floor. A piston can only push 12 blocks, so I need a second one to reach the top. Let's test it to make sure we didn't make any mistakes. Now let's make the last button panel. This time we have two stops, so there are two buttons. 
I start with the one to go all the way down, which uses exactly the same concept as before, where we activate the T-flip flop that corresponds to the break. This is the only one we need to activate, because the only way we could reach this floor is when all the lower breaks were turned off. The button does seem to control the break like intended, but let's test it to make sure. It works so now we'll make the button to stop at the first level. Like I just said, we know that those brakes are turned off when we are where we are, so we need to activate that T flip flop. Let's test it! Looks like I did an oopsie. Of course this button also needs to unpower the brakes of the floor where I'm on, but that's an easy fix with just one more redstone dust. To not mess with the state of the T flip flop, I use the other button to go back down. Now everything works like intended. We're done, but before I end the video I want to show which options you have for the shaft blocks like I promised. I call them shaft blocks because they are the only type of blocks you may place directly next to the elevator so that our sticky blocks ignore them. The first one that's kinda obvious is air, but here are some alternatives. Obsidian, glazed terracotta, storage units including all furnace types, beehives and jukeboxes. Scaffolding and liquids like lava are also an option. I especially like the last one for underwater bases or even under lava in the nether. This is a fast travel ship and in this video I'll teach you how to make one. Let's start with an example of how it could look once it's implemented. The captain says we're ready for departure, so I make my way to the cabin, where I press the button and before we know it, we're out at sea. I have no idea how long the journey will take. So I head up to the quarter deck, where we see that Captain Smith says that we should arrive tomorrow morning. So I decide to spend the rest of the day fishing. I really like to have this stage out at sea, because it feels more like a journey. But of course it's possible to skip it, as you'll see later in the video. I just find it relaxing, but the whole point of this video is to teach you how to implement a version that best fits your needs and desires. It's getting dark. So I quickly end up my fishing, after which I go to the cabin to get a good night's sleep. When I wake up, we've arrived at our destination, just like was promised. I then spend the day at the Mushroom Island, after which I decide to go back. This time I'll show you what it looks like if you skip the phase at sea, so you can decide for your own if you want to have it or not. Looks like we've arrived at our original starting location. And then now to the actual tutorial. This build combines the concept I talked about in my past few short videos. So if you're confused by anything I'm saying, I recommend you go watch the corresponding video. As some people might have figured out, this is actually an illusion that is created by building identical ships around two or more stasis chambers. Of course we still need to send a redstone signal to the other stasis chambers to make the teleportation work. Because the ships float out at sea, we can't really connect a redstone wire to it. This means that we don't really have a choice but to send the signal through the nether. People who have seen my long distance redstone video know it would be best to do this anyway, since the signal needs to travel a lot of blocks. As I've shown in the demonstration, I really like to use a pad to activate redstone, because it really adds to the illusion. If you let an observer face to a bed, both the start of your sleep and the ending will activate a redstone signal. Important to note is that if an ender pearl collides while you sleep, you won't be teleported, making the contraption fail. 
For the illusion to work the best we can, we need to time the redstone to take 51 redstone ticks. Because a knight takes 50 and a half redstone ticks. Because I used 29 redstone ticks in the overworld to send and receive the signal to the nether, we still need to delay the signal for 22 redstone ticks in the nether. This means that we can use a maximum of 22 regular repeaters in the nether until we need to start using zero tick repeaters if we want our timing to match with us waking up. With all time and distance spent in the nether, we mustn't forget to load the chunks. We can do this by placing a chunk loader every third chunk, since we only need to load the chunks when we are sending a redstone signal however, we can actually use one-time chunk loaders that are activated by the same redstone signal instead. This reduces lag when we are not using the ships, but it requires more resources, since we need to place one every other chunk for the redstone to be able to reach the next loader. Now that we've built the framework, we just need to build a ship around it. I won't be giving you guys a block by block tutorial of this, but if you really want one, let me know in the comments. After we've built our ship, we just need to build exactly the same ship at our destination. An easy way to do this is to use a mod like Lightmatica, so you have ghost blocks to make sure you don't mess up. It's also perfectly possible to just take some screenshots from the different perspectives to base you on. Now we know how to make the most basic version, let's take time to look at a possible upgrade that requires significantly more resources. The plan is to throw the ender pearl at your starting location and then transport it all the way to the destination so that your friends can use the same ship without having to ever visit the destination. To increase the roleplay aspect we can rename the ender pearl to be a ticket but of course this is just some added flair. The simple but not recommended way to do this is to make a water slide to transport the pearl to your destination. This is only possible in the overworld because you need to place water and it is also very slow so I would only do it for a very short journey. The easiest way to make such a slide is to first make a water stream by going down a block every 7th block. To make the ender pearl float we need to have a water source block on top of a soul sand block beneath the stream so we go down two blocks and place a soul sand block there. On top of the soul sand we can create a water source block by placing and destroying kelp. The more complicated way is to first remove all the randomness of the pearl using an ender pearl aligner like the one from Ojapa Terrorista. When this is done we can propel it forward using slime blocks. To save travel time we can then launch it into the nether to do the rest of the transport there. If you do this, you need to take into account a weird behavior of enderpearls passing through portals. If an enderpearl passes through a portal from the overworld, it needs to spend at least 17 seconds in the nether before it can enter another portal back to the overworld. If it tries to enter a portal before that, the timer resets as you can see here. Whichever method you end up using, I highly recommend you time how long the journey of the Ender Pearl takes, so you can place a timer at the original location. This way you know when you can actually use the ship. That's it for the tutorial. I hope I've showed you enough so you can start making your own version. As you've probably realized, you can really give your own spin on the concept. Maybe you build a very large ship with lots of room so it can be used by a lot of people. Or maybe you make one with multiple different destinations. Or you decide to go a more modern route and build a cruise ship. Or you go even more extreme and decide to build a fast travel spaceship above the nether instead. The possibilities are endless and I'm really curious what you guys come up with. So definitely let me know in the comments if you end up making your own version. This was my first ever longer video and I really enjoyed making it, but I also realize it has many flaws, so if you were confused by anything, don't be afraid to ask.
Welcome to Cover It Up, the Minecraft series where we look for ways to hide our ugly farms under structures that better fit the theme of our base. In this first episode, we're going to look at the most basic mob farm that I see pop up everywhere. Let's start in a good old fashioned plain medieval village. My first instinct is to go for a tower because it also works for mob farms with more layers. You just need to build a larger tower. I won't give a block by block tutorial because it kind of speaks for itself, but some general advice for building towers is to start wide at the bottom, then build a little thinner in the middle and then go wide again at the top. If you don't feel like adding too much detail, even a few adjustments can make your ugly farm look a lot better in my opinion. Another option is to go for a windmill. The problem here is that windmills classically go from wide at the bottom to small at the top so you end up with a pretty big build if you want it to look somewhat decent. We can also acknowledge that we don't really need to shoot beneath and make something like a hot air balloon. Or if we haven't built our farm yet, we can also look for an overhanging cave and just build it by mining a bit. Next we'll go to the jungle biome, where I chose to build a giant tree around it. Building something like this in survival can be intimidating, so here are some tips. Start with making a non-perfect circle around the base and build it up for a few layers. Then it's time to add some variants by for example moving the circle a block now and then. If you want some greens in the lower part of the trunk, you can plant some trees now and then when you're about halfway there. When you get near the top, it's time to add some branches. Just use some wooden blocks that start at the trunk and go up now and then. Plant some trees next to the branches to get some randomly generated greens. Then add leaves between the branches so the cobblestone gets hidden. Don't forget to light everything up because we only want the spawns to be inside the farm. Now plant some bigger trees where the branches come out so we get some more volume. Make sure to connect the branches to the big trees. Now go on the roof and make sure all the cobblestone is hidden. Now if you want you can first build a tree house, after which you can fill the rest up with more trees and leaves. Finally add some roots to finish the build. For the desert biome, I couldn't really come up with something else than just another tower. I was thinking of going for a temple, but most desert themed temples have the same problem as windmills. You could let a tower be a part of a temple though, like in Minecraft generated desert temples. And then as a final theme, I wanted to go a more modern route. My first instinct was building an apartment building, but I'm pretty bad at building in that style so I decided to embrace the fact that it's an automatic farm and build a cooling tower instead. For now it looks a bit dull, since it's just a standalone cooling tower, but since my plan is to add a bunch of farms, I will keep adding to this until I have a giant factory. If you have a suggestion for which kind of farm I should tackle next, be sure to leave a comment down below.